Welcome back. Well, today we are looking at a court that allows the health officials to give blood transfusions to a Jehovah's Witness toddler. So if you can imagine that in a situation like that. So this is a problem uh, with uh, the Jehovah's Witness doctrine is that they've went beyond what the scriptures say, and we have many videos on this, but they've went beyond the scriptures and they've applied this blood doctrine. Now this blood doctrine has changed over the years. It started out no blood transfusions, I think back in 1956. And then it came, uh, well, you could do fractions. You know, so a lot of people died in between that time. And then they could do fractions of blood and it's conscientious a little bit on the fractions. And now, well, health officials, courts are stepping in and they're saying enough is enough. And this uh, really goes to an area, I'm gonna actually pull it up on the map here, where we're, um, where we're looking at today here. It's uh, in Australia, Sydney. And it's the uh, Sydney, or the uh, Australian Healthcare Commission. So if you don't know where Sydney is, Sydney, Australia, it's right here. There's a lot happening right now in uh, Australasia regarding Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, abuse with children. So uh, there's, uh, this is hitting the headlines big time. So the headlines today are the NSW court. Now, that's in Sydney. Now, this is very recent news, Monday the 23rd, October, just a few days ago. And uh, so they're allowing this witness toddler to have a transfusion. Now, here's the whole story. The uh, regional New South Wales health officials have won a court order authorizing them to give blood transfusions to a Jehovah's Witness toddler if needed in the surgery. And the Supreme Court has been told the girl, three, who can only be referred to as JL, is in need of two surgical procedures. Justice Trish Henry, when handing down her judgment on Thursday, outlined a range of medical issues impacting the child. JL was born with a range of serious medical conditions, including renal abnormalities, cardiac defect, and developmental problems and is dependent on tube feeding, which requires regular replacement, Justice Henry said. The justice said, due to their religious beliefs, the child's parents did not consent to the use of blood. The plaintiff's application has been brought as JL's parents are Jehovah's Witnesses, she said. In accordance with their belief, they have not consented to JL receiving blood or blood product transfusions in connection with the pur purposed surgeries. So the court intervenes. The justice said the court could legally intervene in some circumstances. The power of the court under that jurisdiction to make orders, including where the parents of the child have not consented to medical treatment, is well established, Justice Henry said. On such an application, the overriding criteria to be applied by the court is the best interests and welfare of the child. The role of the court on the application such as this is to exercise an independent and objective judgment so as to balance the advantage or disadvantage of the medical procedures under the consideration. And the court was told medical team, the medical team was sensitive to the parents' wishes despite seeking to have their des desires vetoed. And they have considered and will continue to take steps to exhaust all alternative treatments and will adopt a blood conser conservation strategy in the course of the surgeries as part of the jail's recovery, the court heard. And despite this, the evidence from her treating specialists is that it may be clinically necessary to treat jail with blood and or blood products in connection with the surgical procedures to manage the risk of damage to her health, including the risk of death. So now we talk about the parents' considerations. So Justice Henry concluded the authorizing the use of blood, if needed, was in the best interest of the child. 
You see, the reason the co folks just to intercept here, the reason is, is that a lot of children grow up out of this religion and quit the religion. So could you imagine the child dying before they have a chance to actually make a honest decision? You know, the court's doing the right thing. So she, she said, the, the, the judge, that the parents uh, cooperated in the ongoing medical treatment of JL. And relevant to this application, the parents have consented to JL undergoing two surgeries that JL's treating specialist and medical team at the hospital have recommended, just as Henry has said. And she said the court took into account the parents' strongly held convictions. However, based on the medical evidence and the submission advanced by the parties, it was clearly in JL's best interests and welfare to authorize the proposed treatment in advance of her upcoming surgeries, she said. Suppression and non-publication orders mean the child, her family, doctors, nurses, and hospitals cannot be identified. So that's the rest of that story. These are stories that you'll never hear on JW.org. Uh, this is what's happening in the courts. And again, all of these uh, courts cost money. It costs money to hire lawyers. Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, JW.org is hiring lawyers for its members they want they want to get they want to protect them so they're hiring lawyers they want to protect their doctrine and it, it's costing lots of money ties our courts up in some cases uh, innocent children are dying because what if the child needs blood today in the court order and it takes time to go to court uh, Jehovah's Witness lawyers fight this and uh, you know weeks can go by so it's interesting as we move forward, especially with the new Jehovah's Witness release on November 6th, how blood will be looked at in the future. So that brings an end to uh, this part of the uh, program. I have another little segment here I want to run, and it's a few minutes, and if you just hang in there, it's uh, a video that's put out by another uh, one of our creators on this side. Okay, so we're at Watchtower Help Admin, and uh, this these videos are put together by Frank. Frank used to work at the uh, New York Bethel got with the governing body, and uh, he quit or he uh, woke up in 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 uh, Watchtower Bethel, Warwick, and uh, he he approached the <laughs> committee with his why you know why he was waking up, and they kicked him out of course. So anyways, uh, Frank is very talented. This is a video he put together, The Near-Death Experience of Anthony Morris. But what I'm going to play here is just the beginning of it. There, I got this ready to go right at the beginning here. And uh, we're going to run it for just a few minutes. It's an 18-minute video. We're, we're going to run about half of it. And uh, then you can go on to his site, play the whole thing, and look at a bunch of his other videos. But this really explains the blood doctrine. And to any Jehovah's Witnesses out there that need an explanation, this will help you. So we're going to let it go. Here we are. Nurse, isn't this our DWI patient? I ordered two units of blood, a CAT scan, and booking the OR for emergency surgery. The man has internal bleeding, so there's no time to lose. What's he still doing here? It looks like you've done nothing. He's not even hooked up to oxygen. What? He's a Jew? No, not a Jew, a JW, a Jehovah's Witness. They're the ones who won't take blood. So, Dr. Henderson said it was pointless to do anything else, because without blood, he'll be dead in a few minutes no matter what we do. The man came in unconscious. How do you know he's a JW? He had one of these. I recognize it from other patients I've seen. And our chaplain, Pastor Russ, has seen the patient on the internet. Yes, it's Anthony Morris III. He's one of their leaders, the governing body they call themselves. He's a real stickler on their prohibition on blood. Well, page Dr. Charles and ask him to declare the man incompetent to make his own medical decisions. Then give him the blood, stat. No! You can't do that! 
That's a violation of the laws of God and man. Excuse me, but who are you? A family member? I'm Fred Krantz of the HLC, the Hospital Liaison Committee. I'm here to ensure this man's wishes are honored and his rights are respected and to explain to you what blood fractions he can and cannot accept in order to maintain his integrity to Jehovah, our God. A lawyer? No. Has the patient legally given you power of attorney? Well, no. Then you have no business being here. Get out of here before I call security. This man's life is in danger, and you're wasting our time. No. Brother Morris would want me here. Defending his religious freedom. It's all a mistake, though. You know, your ban on blood. It's not against God's law to accept blood. Oh, I'd expect as much from a clergyman. Have you never read Acts chapter 15? For the Holy Spirit and we ourselves have favored adding no further burden to you except these necessary things, to keep abstaining from things sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you carefully keep yourselves from these things, you will prosper. Good health to you. Injecting blood into your veins is not abstaining from blood. Yes, I have read that. Have you ever read Leviticus 19 verse 19? You should keep my statutes. You must not interbreed two sorts of your domestic animals. You must not sow your field with two sorts of seed, and you must not wear a garment made with two sorts of thread mixed together. Care to show us the label on your suit? I'll bet it violates that last biblical rule. It's a wool and silk blend. So, what? That's from the Mosaic Law. That law passed away with Jesus' sacrifice. It's not binding on Christians today. Oh, so you're saying that we must consider the context of a scripture? and not just yank it out and follow it as if it necessarily applies to us today? Of course. So then, maybe if we consider the context of abstain from blood, it would reveal the fact that it too is not something binding on Christians today. In the first place, this is not a commandment from God or Jesus. It is the words of someone named James. Who is this James, and why should we assume that he had any business encumbering Christians with such rules? When Jesus was asked what the commandments were, did he mention any of these dietary restrictions? No, he did not. He stated two commandments to rule all behavior, to love God and to love your neighbor. So, why would James, as a follower of Christ, take it upon himself to add extra commandments? The fact is, he wouldn't, no real Christian would. So, what was going on here? Well, the first verse of that chapter in the book of Acts gives us the answer. It tells us that certain men, known as Judaizers, were insisting that Gentile Christians needed to get circumcised. The meeting, related in Acts 15, was called to decide the matter. James disagreed with the need for circumcision, but in order to appease the Judaizers, decided to caution Gentile Christians against violating the more publicly obvious of the Jewish customs, such as engaging in lewd behavior, eating meat sacrificed to idols, or eating meat that had not been properly bled. The Bible clearly states that this was the reason for the decision, not that it was a commandment from God that involved a Christian salvation, but rather because, according to verse 21, From ancient times Moses has had those who preach him in city after city, because he is read aloud in the synagogues on every Sabbath. The advice was that these practices be abstained from, because Jews certainly would consider the eating of such meats as participating in heathen idolatry. Christian freedom did not obligate one to follow the dietary laws of the Jews. Paul makes this crystal clear in 1 Corinthians, chapters 8 and 10, where he writes that he, as a Christian, is perfectly free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. Nevertheless, it was advisable that the Gentile Christians abstain from the use of their liberty in this matter, out of deference to the weaker brethren, Jews and Gentiles, who could not so deeply philosophize and whose consciences might be injured. A similar thought attaches to the prohibition of the use of blood. To the Jew it was forbidden, and under his covenant it was made a symbol of life. To partake of it would imply responsibility for the life taken. These prohibitions had never come to the Gentiles, because they had never been under the law covenant, 
but so deeply rooted were the Jewish ideas on this subject that it was necessary to the peace of the church that the Gentiles should observe this matter also. If they did not wish to be contentious and cause divisions in the church, the Gentile brethren would surely be willing to restrain or sacrifice their liberty respecting these matters. However, today there are no Jews or Christians, outside of the Jehovah's Witnesses, who would be stumbled by a Christian having a blood transfusion. So, the rationale behind the request that James made no longer exists. Therefore, Christians are free to have blood transfusions. Well, that's certainly a pretty speech. But it's wrong. Gentiles were prohibited from blood, even though they were never under the Mosaic Law. Being descendants of Noah, they came under the everlasting covenant made with Noah after the flood. Didn't you make it past chapter 4 of Genesis in your seminary? There we read God's command. Only flesh with its life, its blood, you must not eat. I can comment on that. In Hebrew school we were taught from the Talmud that this means that we are not to eat flesh from a living being, not to bite into an animal that is alive, with its life still in it. Interesting, I hadn't considered that before, yet that's literally what the verse says. It's a prohibition against eating a certain type of flesh, living flesh. It's not a prohibition against blood at all. Oh, that's just hair-splitting semantics. It's obvious that God wants us all to abstain from blood. Well, there's another verse in the Bible that contradicts your idea that Gentiles were forbidden to eat blood. In Deuteronomy 14 verse 21 we read, You must not eat any animal that was found dead. You may give it to the foreign resident who is inside your cities, and he may eat it, or it may be sold to a foreigner. For you are a holy people to Jehovah your God. An animal found dead would not have been properly bled. That's why a Jew could not eat it, being part of a holy people, under a covenant with God, but the verse tells us that a non-Jew could eat it, blood and all. Surely you haven't been sacrificing people's lives on the basis of such flimsy misinterpretations of scripture. Have you? No, there's more to it than that. We see a consistent pattern throughout the Bible of God condemning the eating of blood. Leviticus 17 verse 14 is another clear instance. Leviticus? Isn't that part of the Mosaic Law? You know it is. But you already said, when I mentioned that your apparel violates that law, that Christians are no longer under that law. Is that correct? Or did I misunderstand you? You didn't misunderstand. But I'm not using Leviticus here as a law, but as a principle. God hates the use of blood. Yet he created vampire bats, mosquitoes, and a host of other creatures who cannot survive without eating blood. He allowed Gentiles to eat unbled animals, and he allowed Paul, under inspiration, to state that a Christian could eat anything sold in the market without being concerned that they might be eating meat sacrificed to idols or meat from an unbled animal. Why would that be, if he hated it so much? Well, I don't claim to know everything. All I know is that if we try to save our life by violating God's laws, then we'll lose our everlasting life. That's a deeply held religious conviction that I'm sure even you gentlemen can appreciate. No! I can't appreciate it at all. In Hebrew school we learned the rabbinic principle known as Pikwach Nefesh, saving life supersedes God's law. That's wonderful. But we're Christians not Jews. Oh, but Jesus lived by this principle as well. It's taught to us in Matthew chapter 12. At that season Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples got hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. At seeing this the Pharisees said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what it is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he, and the men with him, got hungry? How he entered into the house of God, and they ate the loaves of presentation, food it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those with him, but for the priests only. Jesus didn't believe that one should starve to death before breaking a commandment. His actions and teachings show that he believed that God's commandments could be broken in life or death situations. As he said, the law was made for man and not man for the law. It was meant to be a help in living a good life, not a cause for death. Your own Watchtower magazine reached the same conclusion when commenting on these verses, stating that 
Jesus was calling attention to acts of mercy on the Sabbath day, that it was perfectly legitimate to render a show of mercy to one who is in need even though it was the Sabbath, and that there is, in effect, no violation of the Sabbath by such course of action. So, even if you still mistakenly think that accepting blood violates God's law, then this principle should show you that when it comes to saving a life, there is no violation. Okay, that's just part of the video. Um, you'll have to go to his site and watch the rest of the video. But I wanted to take a look at uh, this one point here on the video where it talks about Paul uh, makes this crystal clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 10 where he writes that he as a Christian is perfectly free to eat meat sacrificed to idols. So I wanted to uh, take a look at that and just hang in there and we'll actually open up the scriptures right now. Okay, so I have it opened up to uh, 1 Corinthians 8 and this is an English Standard Version. And this is where Paul's talking about this food offered to idols. We'll just look at uh, this one part. So in, in verse 7 there he says, However, uh, uh, they're talking about this idol. We know that an idol has no real existence and there is no God but one. You're really showing that these idols are really nothing. But uh, he says, however, not all possess this knowledge, but some, though, former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off if we do eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating an idol in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? And so by your knowledge this weak person is destroyed, the brothers for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. So this is really about stumbling. It's not really, it's not a command. You're not going to die. Like it's not, Jehovah's Witnesses have made uh, accepting a blood transfusion they'll disfellowship you and you'll be ostracized, shunned by the congregation. They, they view it as, uh, as you're sinning against God, that you're going to die. That's, that's how they view this. So they, they have an inaccurate view of, uh, of the Bible. They haven't read the Bible, the governing body. But uh, here we have uh, Frank, Frank at uh, Watchtower Helper. Um, he gives a really good explanation. That's Watchtower Help Admin. And I'll put a link to that video in the description below so you can see the rest of it. But folks, that brings an end to our program. I hope it's um, educated you a little bit more on the blood facet and how Jehovah's Witnesses even go to, in, in the hospital, they have an HLC uh, committee member at the hospital trying to guard the person to make sure they're not going to take blood. This is how cultish this whole group is. And we're hoping that in the near future, November 6th, that they may change their viewpoint on this blood doctrine and leave it up to the person's conscience the way it should be. So folks, that brings an end to our program. Thanks for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. It helps push our channel out further. And when you're watching, watch it right through, watch the commercials, go have a coffee, put it on mute. It helps us to actually get paid. So thanks again, and we'll catch you next time. And until then, keep living your life with love. Bye for now. Oh, hello. My name is Vern. Join the channel. We cover JW World News and we give you the rest of the story. Today we're going to the Watchtower and we have lives on Tuesday nights and Saturdays and an excellent community. So join the channel 
and watch as we crash into the watchtower. Here it is, I see it coming. Woo! Join us as we report in on the watchtower.